very much. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today. Some of you were welcoming back, actually, to the, to the Georgina Mace Centre. This is the 75th anniversary of Silwood Park. It was purchased by Imperial College way back in the 40s, and since then we've had many decades of research uh, across all different fields, pure and applied ecology, ev evolutionary biology, etc. And it's a great pleasure to bring everyone here today to see you know, where we are with the current state of our knowledge in that area, and also how that translates into policy and wider society, etc. So we have a, a fantastic range of speakers. We'll have a very lively uh, debate. We've spoken to some of our speakers already who said that they will be looking forward to some feisty discussion, so please feel free to join in once that all kicks off. Um, so I don't really want to spend any further time going through my, my part of this. Uh, just to say that I'm Professor Guy Woodward. I'm the Deputy Head of Life Sciences here at Silwood Park. If you want to speak with me further about any of the events around the, uh, the anniversary, then please feel free to do so. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Professor Matt Fisher, who is one of the co-directors of the Georgina May Centre, and he'll fill you in on the details for tonight. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so yeah, I'm Matt Fisher. I'm the co-director of the Georgina May Center, and we uh, launched last year, and it was a, a, an amazing, um, amazing to launch the center. Uh, there are many people in the audience here who knew Georgina very well, and I used to work with her in the Institute of Zoology. Um, so I'm representing the School of Public Health. So the Georgina May Center is a cross-faculty institution. Uh, center. Um, we hope it'll go bigger than that and that we'll be able to include other institutions as well and that it doesn't have this inclusive imperial badge to it um, because Georgina Mace ranged so wildly. Um, in the School of Public Health we view biodiversity as the Jekyll and Hyde so of course it explodes out of nowhere and extirpates uh, species across the planet. I'm holding a dead frog in a pot there as a piece of biodiversity, a chytrid marches across the planet an infectious disease. But at the same time, biodiversity is something with which, without which we cannot survive. We're finished without it. So this uh, is an idea which we'll play with today. And when we were scoping ideas for what we'd actually focus this meeting on, I remembered a discussion between Gideon and Andy last uh, summer when you were both here. And um, Gideon looked at Andy and said, Andy, um, so Gideon's the chief scientific advisor of, uh, for, for, for DEFRA, and he said, Andy, how can we measure biodiversity in a way that government will understand? And Andy gave an absolutely fantastic answer. Um, and it was so good that I thought, well, let's just replay that whole situation again a year later. Um, of course, Andy then said, but I'm, the, I'm going to talk about something completely different, and Gideon probably will as well. Um, but that's fine, you know. So it's, but the, this is this is the, this is the idea of you know, biodiversity matters. We know that, but how does it matter? And 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 this is what we're here to uh, explore today. So um, thank you very much. I'll hand on to my uh, buddy in arms here, Vincent. Yes, yeah, uh, thank you everybody for coming and, and I'm, I will be very brief, but just basically uh, it's another event that we're organizing, um, thinking about Georgina and carrying on with what um, she set up so um, beautifully for, for so many years. And I'm also happy to uh, announce that, so that's one event we've done as a center, but we have just heard uh, we skate and actually um, led by uh, John who is uh, here. Um, the Royal Society is also going to fund a two days conference next June, I think it's 13th and 14th of June, uh, which will be sort of carrying on the discussion that we have now, but at a much um, you know, bigger scale um, at the Royal Society uh, over two days. So that's a, the, the different thing that we, we're trying to do to remember um, Georgina. So today we're going to have um, you know, four, four speakers, and um, Bonnie uh, Wang is going to chair the discussion. We are very lucky to have Bunny. She um, came from the US uh, two years ago. She was at uh, Utah University, and she's now at the Grandson Institute and the Department of Licenses. So it's all over to you now.
Hi everyone, so we're really lucky to have an amazing set of speakers today. I'm going to be introducing them and compressing many accomplishments so that we can spend more time hearing from them. Um, so Adam Afrie is the Member of Parliament for Windsor, representing many of us in this room. He's actually an alumnus of Imperial College and has been the Chairman of the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology since 2010. Next, we'll hear from Professor Kate Jones of University College London, where she heads the People and Nature Lab. And among other achievements, she's a contributor to the UK Committee on Climate Change, and she also received the 2008 Leverhulme Award for Excellent Services to Zoology. After that, we'll hear from Gideon Henderson, who is a professor of Earth Science at the University of Oxford, and also a fellow of the Royal Society. Since 2019, he's been the scientific advisor to DEFRA. And after that, we'll hear from Professor Andy Purvis, who's a leader of science at the Natural History Museum. He was also a professor here for many years. Um, he runs the PREDICTS program to forecast the future of biodiversity and was a lead contributor to the IP Best report, the Global Biodiversity Assessment. Um, so to keep us to time, each speaker is going to have exactly 10 minutes. After that, we're going to open it up for a Q&A so that you can follow up on the questions they have and allow them to respond to each other. And we'll begin with Adam Afrie. Thanks. So thank you very much indeed. I thought today that I would um, put the cat among the pigeons. I'm not going to just speak as the uh, chair of the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology. I'm also going to speak as a politician and a local politician, just to make it a little bit more exciting. <laughs> so by way of background, um, I, was, I am a, um, an alumni of, um, of Imperial. I was at Y College and I studied agricultural economics. I'm the local MP um, here in Windsor. And from I was elected in 2005. And from 2007 to 2010, I was the Shadow Science Minister under David Cameron. And then from 2010 onwards, I've chaired the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology. And when I was Shadow Minister, um, one of the key things that became apparent to me was that research and research funding and where it goes is what matters. It's like the lifeblood for the theories, for the evidence, for the science that we develop, not the following year, but five or ten years later. And one of the key things I tried to ensure um, as Shadow Minister was that the, that the budgets for research um, remained, we were talking at that time, by the way, of 20, I don't know if you recall, but of 20% cuts to um, research spending. And everyone was going apoplectic, including me. And finally, with Oliver Letwin and with David Cameron, I managed to get us to secure um, even funding for those following two years, and it's gone up since. And we also, in, in, um, also introduced the UK research um, framework, um, UKRI, so that actually um, the politicians, we meddling politicians, um, can't actually direct um, specific projects to, our, to meet our own political ends. And one of the other things I was proud of as um, Shadow Science Minister that became policy shortly afterwards was that um, I came up with the idea that we should um, enshrine the Haldane principle um, into ministerial code. And that's taken place, and I think it's made, a, it's made science funding secure um, for the longer term in terms of where it's directed. But when I first came into Parliament, um, I can honestly say to you that um, the environment was important to most, you know, to the public, but it was not one of the top ten issues, not in any way, shape or form. Um, and today I'm going to talk about why I'm optimistic for where we are today, um, and then I shall leave it to you chaps to tell me why it's terrible. <laughs> the reason I'm optimistic today is this, is that um, we do have chief scientific advisors across government, virtually every department now has a chief scientific advisor, and they are basing the advice that they give to ministers and to government on the latest science. I perform part of the functions as the chair of the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology in ensuring that we prepare the latest state of science on all the issues that may face government so that MPs and peers, their researchers and government have a very easy to digest short summary um, on each topic. And if you look at the Parliamentary Office of Science, Te science Technology site, um, you can see the hundreds of post notes that we've produced. And if you look at parliamentary debate, both in the Lords and the Commons, you'll often see people holding these post notes when they're, when they're making their speeches to ensure 
that whilst we're arguing about ideology and outcomes, we're actually not arguing about the science, the evidence, and the facts. Now, we politicians will always cherry pick, so we'll, we try, we'll try and get round it. But actually, um, it's, I'm very proud of what we do there because that feeds into the policy making that's made by government. If you haven't already seen them, there are a couple of post notes directly related to the event today um, on biodiversity the definition of biodiversity, the frameworks in legislation for biodiversity, and now we're just about to produce, it's not yet published, but we're just about to publish um, a post note which talks about um, net gain and how, in regulation um, and economically, how you may introduce that um, into our current framework. And I expect that to come up uh, pretty soon. The reason I'm optimistic is this. People weren't talking about the environment very much. Um, back in 2005 or back in 2003. Now, we c I can honestly say that even when it comes to us politicians seeking re-election, that actually the environment is one of the top items on the agenda. Yes, it's just been topped by the cost of living, inevitably, when people can't pay, pay their um, bills on a month-to-month -month basis, but it's top of the agenda. And I would challenge anyone in this room to name a political party in Westminster that doesn't put the environment towards the top of their agenda. There is no political party that doesn't say they're committed to the environment. Yes, there are nuances. Yes, yeah, I can see people giggling. Yes, there are nuances. <laughs> um, yes, there are differences. But fundamentally, can I just say that biodiversity, the environment, as an issue, has won. It's at the top of the agenda. There's not a meeting I go to, a policy meeting. There's not a debate I'm in where the environment, where concern for biodiversity is not mentioned. So that's why I'm optimistic, because the zeitgeist the mood of Westminster, the mood for lawmakers, the mood in government is that the environment matters. We weren't there in the past, we're there now. But what does that mean in reality? I can stand up here and wax lyrical. What does it actually mean? Well, I can tell you what it means. It means we now have the Environment Act 2021. Now again, is it perfect? Of course it's not. But what it sets out is a framework with which all the political parties agree, a framework which can be populated in the future. And I was having a conversation just before coming up here about them, um, but surely you politicians have to sh deal with short-term measures, get yourself elected at the next election. That is true. But, 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 but this is why we set up um, acts like the Environment Act, which means that future governments can populate it, can use those powers, can use those statutory instruments. DEFRA can use parts of that act to make sure that they're bringing through the policies that need to be seen on the ground. And one example I would give is that um, now local authorities, it's not in stone yet, but local authorities will have to, will have to consider making 30% um, of, their, um, of their area um, 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 what word should I use? Um, compatible with biodiversity, compatible with wildlife. What's more, local authorities and other statutory bodies are now under, going to be under enormous pressure to ensure that we, have, um, that we have wildlife networks, that we have biodiversity networks, that all of these things, the pressure is there to, for them to be delivered. Is it right today? No, but this is the foundation on which we can build. Without that act, we would not even be in a position where we could start to build the framework for the future. So I'm really optimistic about that. And again, when it comes to the national planning and policy framework, it is absolutely clear that developers, that local authorities, that anyone involved in development or house building, some of the biggest house builders in the country, they must now have an eye on the environment. These are huge steps forward from when I was young in the 70s and 80s. It was just completely and utterly ignored. And some of the problems we created then, we're going to have to correct now at a, a, a vast expense. So again, the framework is there and now, the pressure is to ensure that as we populate that framework with specific measurements and specific targets, as we attempt to shape COP15, that that framework then begins to permeate across the globe. And I think it's our responsibility as a developed nation, as an advanced nation, to make sure that we perform that function of pushing this agenda worldwide. Because there is no excuse for us to do well here in the UK over time, but to simply be outsourcing all of the problems to other countries. Um, and that will require action, both in tax on taxation, in terms of incentives, incentives and penalties, but also in terms of import duties, but also in terms of intense diplomatic pressure to ensure that our allies and even our non-allies across the globe are committing um, to these targets and committing to these measurement systems. So is it perfect today? No. 
But do I believe that we have in Westminster, in the UK, set a framework that can work incredibly well with a few nips and tucks? Yes, I do. And um, I'm very encouraged by how far we've come. We're way behind the curve. There's a lot more to do. Um, but I hope with my hat in the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology that any um, evolution in those policies, that any evolution in those frameworks is based on science and evidence. And one call I make to all of you chaps here today is please, please, let's take a proper look at what we're measuring. Let's take a proper look at what we're measuring so that actually governments and businesses can be held accountable for specific outcomes. Because we all feel we want to protect the environment, but feelings don't create targets. Feelings don't create incentives. It's legislation, it's taxes, it's penalties, it's the entire ecosystem and environment you set up when people are taking econo undertaking economic activity in society. So I'm optimistic and I very much look forward to the Q&A session. Thank you very much indeed. Hi everybody. Uh, well, thanks for inviting me and it's really brilliant to see so many uh, friends in the audience and, uh, and colleagues. So um, I guess I was, I was asked to talk about kind of the current, well, kind of the future of biodiversity and the interaction with policy and, you know, challenges and opportunities. So I think I want to start with Georgina, if I can. And uh, this is a paper that she published in 2014. And it, it really took me a while, actually, to understand what the paper was about and also how important it is. And, and I think it's actually changed my science fundamentally thinking about this. And um, I think what it does is kind of put some evidence around what has happened in the last 60 or 70 years and the utter transformation that has gone on around nature and people's relationship with nature and understanding of that. So I, I'm just going to go through this because I think it's really, I think it's a really, it's a really fundamental part of what I do now. So in the 60s, nature was thought to be kind of separate. It was separate in areas. Na nature was in parks. And that led to a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, it was great to save those areas, but it, it also led to a lot of inequalities and things which, you know, were not hugely proud of by removing some of the kind of indigenous populations from those areas. So that was the kind of prevailing view in, in the 60s and 70s um, with the start of the environmental movement and Rachel Carson uh, published Silent Spring. And then in the 80s and 90s when I started getting involved in, in this area, we were all talking about, well, what's driving extinction? And, um, you know, can we can we understand what's happening and what the threats are? And then in the 2000s, there was a, a really big shift, a kind of watershed moment where we realized that we could start talking to policymakers, politicians, about what it means, what the value of nature was. And that was a kind of controversial idea because if you start to value nature, you can also destroy it and pay a sum for that, for that uh, privilege. But it also meant we started talking in the same language to economists and politicians and policymakers and it being a real lever for change. And I think that was a real moment for us as a community. And now I think I've seen this transformation into not just about what nature can do for us, but how we live together sustainably and that kind of social, economic, ecological interaction that we all live in. And I think that's, that's where we are now. And, and I think Georgina would be the first to say that not everybody would agree with that, but also some people are still in certain sections of that, but also, also hold those positions equally <laughs> in their mind about where they think they are. But I think I, I want you to kind of realize that it's not all bad. And, and, and I don't want to stand up here and be really, um, 
you know, really uh, depressing about the state of nature because I think there, there are things that we can do. And just to, to give you some evidence for that, I just want to give you... I just destroyed the microphone. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Um, I just want to give you a few examples which I think are uh, interesting to me. So... Um, as Adam was saying, we've, got, we've had a profound problem recognition. So it's not just the Houses of Parliament, but it's a uh, you know, number of organisations all over the world, international organisations. Uh, I just want to show you this survey uh, in earlier this year, identify the most severe risks on a global scale in the next 10 years. And you know, environment's all in the top three and five of them out of ten, half of them are environmental. Now, this wasn't a set of Green MPs sitting in the Houses of Parliament or Greenpeace on a boat thinking about this. This was people at Davos flying in on their private jets making these claims. So there's a huge problem recognition, which I think is amazing. There's a growing evidence base and the kind of evidence that nature is critical to our health, happiness, and future survival on this planet is growing massively all the time. And this is a paper I did uh, a couple of years ago showing that urban and destroyed habitats change the ecosystems that we have, change the animals present. The animals then present are more likely to give us an infectious disease, linking the COVID, well, linking pandemics like the COVID pandemic to our destruction of the environment and changing ecosystems. Finally, I think young people and nature and the relationship between those things is changing as well. And this is a picture of David Attenborough on the pyramid stage at Glastonbury in 2019. And that just shows you the passion and the commitment that younger people have for the environment, which is, is absolutely amazing. And I think those things are a fundamental shift from we where, where I was when I started in 1980s, 1990s. Okay, so the challenges and opportunities ahead that I think are important. So I think we need to get better at understanding the value of nature. And we really need to start to incorporate those long-term values into our assessments of what we're doing. So if we're chopping down a forest we need to think more long term and, and, and internalize those externalities so that we make correct decisions for for us but or for future generations and this is a, a picture of the uh, it best report that came out last week uh, that kind of looked looked at that and, and was understanding some of the metrics we now use for nature and then I think um, we need to start to get better at operationalizing the things that we know. So um, nature-based solutions is just the buzzword now for ecosystem services, but, with, uh, uh, but you can see the change in the name means something. It means that we're more solution focused than we were. We were talking about nature for us and now we're thinking, well, how can it, how can it save us? And so that, what, that naming change, I think, is incredibly important. But how do, we, how do we work out what to do? So how much nature do we need in a city to make it cooler? How, much, how many trees? Where should they be? How, how do you plant those? How do you work out how that interacts with uh, air pollution and flood risk resilience and, and uh, climate change impacts? So we don't know those things as well as we should and we don't connect with local uh, government to work out how to do them. And then finally, we need to start, stop talking to ourselves and start talking to other disciplines. We need to talk to the master planners, the architects, the city councils to design better cities. We need to measure biodiversity, but we need to talk to computer scientists, AI specialists, sensor technologists, in order to design those things so that we can have systems that talk to each other and are an efficient way of mo monitoring that businesses can pick up and use. We need to make sure that 
climate change, uh, nature and ecology is part of the climate change adaptation uh, movement. We need to adapt our cities. We're at 1.1, 1.2 now. What are we going to be in 10 years time? We need to adapt our cities to the stuff that's on now and, and our society to, the, to those things that are coming. And nature is part of that. Is ecology is part of that. Public health is also another, I could go on and on, but public health is also incredibly important and the silos between public health, notwithstanding Matt there, uh, the silos between public health and the environment are massive. So we need to break down those silos and it's certainly not going to be talking in this room to ourselves. We need to be at welcome, we need to be at the public health, WHO, talking about the links between nature and health. So my plea would be ecologists in this room and budding ecologists in this room or old ecologists in this room, the challenge is now, you know, we need to stop talking to ourselves and starting to break down those barriers between, uh, between the disciplines. And, and you're not exempt from this because <laughs> this, if you say this is DEFRA, then the, the, the policies which I, I see and look at from the Climate Change Committee are not joined up in any way. So you, you've just said about, you know, the, the policies, that, and, and I think they are really great and I, I'm really behind those. But, you know, there's one rule for DEFRA, but one rule for SCDO. You know, it's scattered across government and how on earth you manage to figure out what, what is what is, is, is amazing to me. So I think that you could, you could completely say that that is government as well. And I think that needs to rapidly change if we're gonna get anywhere. Thank you very much. Well, I, I thought um, halfway through Kate's talk that we were really going to have a debate um, here and, it, and that was going to be exciting. But you came round to more of the position that I think I'm going to be taking um, in my comments. And both Adam and Kate have given us this rather positive trajectory about the, um, how far we've come in the biodiversity area. And of course, there's much to agree with there. But I, I think I am going to take a rather different take on this and perhaps a rather more pessimistic one um, into the um, discussion that follows. Before I get started, though, uh, let me just say what a pleasure it is to be back here. I was, as has been mentioned here, when uh, Georgina Mace Centre was opened, and it's great to be back again, um, partly to uh, join you all, but also to honour her and her name and her reputation. And she was such a, a wonderful person and great contributor to this to this field. Uh, and now, as a kicking kicking off point, what I what I'd like to do is talk about the two crises that we have at the moment, so the biodiversity one that we're focusing on and the climate crisis as well. And uh, although I share some of Adam's um, optimism about where we've come, I do think that I disagree quite fundamentally with some other aspects of it. One of, one of my jobs in government as DEFRA CSA is very frequently to go into cross Whitehall meetings and remind people that there is an environment and we should be concerned about it and worried about it. And I'm often the, the lone voice in meetings saying that. So major parts of government still have to recognise that biodiversity is a significant challenge. And I think in that respect, biodiversity lags some way behind the other crisis of climate change in political recognition and policy recognition. And I think bluntly that's true in the public as well. And the public have now really latched on to the fact that climate is serious and it impacts on them and they need to worry about it. And they will vote accordingly and act accordingly. I think we're still some way away from that when it comes to biodiversity. We haven't yet seen the, the, the events such as the heat wave we saw earlier this week that have really made people recognise the challenge of biodiversity and how it impacts them. We also see it perhaps in the media and the IPES report that Kate showed there, although it had some pick up in the media, it was certainly in The Guardian um, and, and some other channels, it did not get the sort of attention that an equivalent IPCC report would get where climate would be championed at a much greater scale. So I'd like to ask the question here, why is it that biodiversity still doesn't quite have the traction given what a big crisis it is that climate has? And I think there are two reasons, two reasons that I'm sure many of you will agree with. 
The first is that for biodiversity, I don't think the public can yet really see how it impacts on them personally and their lives and their jobs and their livelihoods. And the second thing is that I think there is no, well, there is no single measure for biodiversity. We don't have a net zero that we can gather around, a single thing that we can, that we can measure. So that's what I'd like to talk about for the, the rest of my few minutes, how we can communicate and connect biodiversity to people and how we can do a better job of measuring it and thinking about the metrics. So on connecting and communicating, one area where I think I might disagree with Kate is, 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 is the care we need to use about the language, and particularly the language of nature. Um, nature is a good word in connecting to people and communicating something that they intrinsically care about. Um, it pulls on your heartstrings, it makes people raise concern, but I, I don't think ultimately when it comes down to um, is, it, is my job on the line, who am I going to vote for, nature is actually a strong enough word or a strong enough reason for people to care about it or recognise that this is a crisis. You can see nature all around you, but it might not be biodiverse nature. You need to communicate more about what it is about biodiversity that is so important. My, my background is, is a, a geochemist, and if I was um, to be somewhat flippant here, I could say, well, I look at nature and think, basically, I'm worried as an inorganic geochemist, how much reduced carbon is there? I mean, how, how much organic carbon? I don't really care about the bio bit. And that's obviously not sufficient if you're really worried about the biodiversity and the threats that we have to biodiversity um, as it's lost. So we mustn't, although nature's a useful word, we mustn't hide behind it. We mustn't, as scientists, give up on attempting to communicate what is biodiversity and why that di diversity aspect is, is so critically important. Climate had to come on this path for a long time, more, perhaps more of a climate scientist than a biodiversity scientist. For a long time, climate had to try and work out how to communicate to people what it was that made climate different from weather and why we cared about it and why it was important. It was 12 degrees hotter in Oxford a couple of days ago than it is today. Um, it, why should a 1.5 degree change make any difference? We had to work out how to tell people that story. And we have to keep trying to do that for biodiversity as well, making it clear to people why that matters. So uh, uh, many people have got different ways of trying to capture why biodiversity really matters, try to communicate that. If you look at the Royal Society publications or uh, World Economic Forum publications, there are different narratives. Three areas that I think are really important in communicating to the public is about the resilience that we get in nature from biodiversity. The fact that without multiple species in the same environment, the system is vulnerable and can be damaged. And we can see that, for instance, with ash dieback. If you had a forest entirely of ash trees, the disease wipes out your whole forest. If ash is only one of your 10 trees, then, um, th then you, have, you lose 10% of the forest and the forest recovers because of its resilient biodiversity. But we can communicate that to people more effectively by bringing it into the food system making people recognise the diversity in the food system, the diversity in the soils in which that food grows is fundamental to, the, to, the, to uh, the food that we rely on. So resilience is important. Ecosystem services, I'm sorry, Kate, but I like that word. It says, what it, it says on the tin what it does. It is the ecosystem providing a service to you, to society. And um, pollination is often used as the flagship here, but we can equally well look at the resources that we take sustainably from nature if we do it wisely, not only food, but of course forestry products that we burn and that we uh, build with. So there's much that we can take from nature in a very sustainable way as part of that ecosystem service. And the third area that I would focus on here, as a, particularly as a scientist, is resources that we take from nature. And perhaps that's an, a controversial thing to say, but we do extract stuff from nature and particularly what we extract from biodiversity is information and knowledge. And we take that in several different ways, but we take it um, particularly from the genetic diversity that we have across nature. And that is such a rich source of information that we, um, we are only just really beginning to tap into um, as we um, understand the genetic diversity and how we can use that and how nature has used that to be so successful over millennia and longer. Now, I'd just like to, to, to show a little bit of an example here um, of why genetic diversity is, is so important. And I, I'm gonna to refer to a report that, that I led on behalf of the Royal Society about marine resources, and particularly 
about um, genetic resource resources in the ocean. And I want to share this for a few reasons. First of all, because I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect this is more of a terrestrial audience than a marine one. So bringing some marine into the audience might, um, might be useful. But also, and even more so, because the report that we wrote for the Royal Society, although Georgina was not directly involved in the report, she was very influential in helping to shape it and advising on their report and, and reviewing it for us. And I, one of the many times that I took inspiration from Georgina personally during, during my career. Um, and one of the things that we pointed to in that report is how in the marine context, there's been such a wealth of information that we're already gathering from the genetic resources in the ocean. Um, if we look at how many products we have developed from the ocean each year, we get oils and things that we don't need to know the genetics of to, to learn about. But since about 1970, our ability to understand the genetics of marine systems have led to a steady linear increase in the number of products that we extract from, the, from ocean species to now be more than 1,500 new products every year that come from marine species. And just one of those that I'll, I'll mention is a drug called Halaven. This is where I really wish I'd had a slide because I'm just going to read some of this out now. I should have read it from a slide. Halaven is an anti-cancer drug. It's an, uh, the active in substance is erbulin, which is a synthetic analogue of the marine natural product halochondrin B. And halochondrin B was extracted from a marine sponge. It's um, been synthetically re recreated and it's now used very widely as a cancer drug, particularly for breast cancer. Its sales in 2015 were 300 uh, million US dollars globally, and that's continued to grow since then. And putting it in monetary terms is one way of judging it, but of course the money tells you it's being sold, and by being sold it is saving lives. And that drug, based on genetics that we got from the diversity of the ocean, is saving lives and making money around the world. We're going to lose that information if we lose um, biodiversity into the future. So I've gone off on a bit of a tangent there, haven't I, into one particular product and one particular example. But I think that as scientists, we need to recognise that one of the reasons why biodiversity is important is because of the genetic diversity that we're just beginning to understand. So that's one feature. I'll, I'll be quicker on the second one, which is how do we um, measure biodiversity and how do we put metrics on it? And I'm not sure I do remember the, 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 the conversation that you challenged us um, with, but I will pick up on it and perhaps Andy will come back to it further as well. There isn't a single measure for biodiversity, uh, nor should there be, I think. We're interested in the diversity, not the singularity of biodiversity. And actually, that's not unusual. And Kate's mentioned adapt, climate adaptation. There is, there is no single metric for adaptation either. There might be for mitigation on net zero, but for adaptation, there's a wide range of things we need to measure and understand. And the same is true for biodiversity, and we should accept that. There's a much um, spoken adage that you, you can't um, manage what you don't measure. That's very much true when you look at biodiversity. What we mostly measure at the moment are species you can see, be they trees, fish, bird, or tree, um, um, or, um, tree or mammals. Um, or, um, or habitats, which again we can easily measure. And it's on the basis of the fact that those are the things we measure frequently that government metrics as part of the Environment Act, uh, the proposed metrics, are based around species and around habitats. And of course we do need to know about those, but is that sufficient? I'd say no it isn't. We need to know much more about biodiversity. We need to know about microbial biodiversity and be able to measure it. And we need to know about genetic diversity which is, coming back to my ash example, one of the reasons why ash trees are, are surviving in some parts of the country, because of that genetic diversity. We're poised now at a time where we can revolutionise how we make measurements of biodiversity, those microbial measurements and those um, genetic measurements, as well as changing the way we measure the observable things. And as scientists in, in this community, not only do we need to rise to the challenges that Kate set at the end of her talk, we also need to think like scientists about how we can measure better so that we can manage better as we go into the future. And I'll leave my remarks there, but look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed for the, uh, the opportunity uh, to speak here again. 
I only come to Silwood when the marquees are up now. So Kate said that she was going to steer clear of, of any depressing stuff. <laughs> right. It's supposed to be inspirational. Inspirational, right. So I'm going to be the desperational uh, one of the, of the team here. So I, I was asked to speak about current concerns and envisaged solutions for biodiversity. Um, and I don't have a picture of Georgina, but my title borrows from her. She coined the term, she coined the phrase, bending the curve of biodiversity loss, trying to turn the decline that we've seen since we started knowing what the global state of biodiversity actually was, largely thanks to Georgina's work, ongoing through our attempts to improve the situation, through our attempts to improve the situation with a single easy target, through to 20 really granular targets, none of which we met. Can we bend the curve? Because we have to. These are the last two northern white rhinos. They're mother and daughter, Najin and Fatu. We've got a million species of animals and plants currently threatened with extinction. And that, I would argue, from the people and nature point of view, and the nature for people point of view, is not what we should be worried about. That's almost the luxury. The bread and butter is functional ecosystems. So if all we were trying to do was stop extinctions, and I think we should try and minimize extinctions, then we could focus. This is, uh, Gideon mentioned, everyone else is a bit terrestrial. This is entirely terrestrial, uh, apart from, so the reason that the oceans there are blue is not so many um, birds, amphibians, and mammals live there. Um, but this is where the, the rare species are concentrated. Zoom in on those areas, restore them, conserve them, and you drive extinction rates and extinction risk way down. Great, happy days. But that won't improve people's lives because those species, the, the species that are most threatened with extinction are the least economically important species by and large, because there's so few individuals. Getting sciencey now. Time for the stick. So, <laughs> so Georgina was one of the uh, authors of this conceptual framework, which is a simplified version of the IPBES conceptual framework. Human well-being, the thing we're after, good quality of life, depends critically on ecosystem services or nature's contributions to people. And they, in turn, depend on healthy ecosystems and biodiversity. And human drivers are reducing those things. So the IPBES Global Assessment recognized all these different kinds of ecosystem service, these different kinds of contributions that we depend on. And all the ones in reddish brown are declining over the last 50 years. We're getting less and less of them. The only things that are going up are the things that we are caning ecosystems to provide because we can market them. And we can capture, as individuals and organizations and actors, the monetary value. And so we are incentivized to produce more and more of these things to sell to the detriment of the public good of all of these other things, which we can't sell so well, but which are critical, particularly critical for people who aren't in the cash economy, the world's most vulnerable people. They don't get most of these benefits. And it's worse than this looks, because actually nature's contribution to these things is falling as well. The only way we're now producing more and more of these things is by putting more energy in in order to get the productivity. It's through fertilizers and uh, other agrochemicals that we are actually managing to keep these things going. Nature is leaving the party. So if we want functioning ecosystems, then we need 
some ecosystem integrity. In my lab, we estimate an indicator, the biodiversity intactness index. It's the average fraction of natural biodiversity that's still left. The planetary boundary, this is one of the indicators in the planetary boundaries framework, is here. Areas that are black are OK. Below that, we're risking nasty ecological and socioeconomic surprises. The UK is in the bottom 10% of countries globally. Now, if we're bothered about this, which we should be, then we're doing different actions in completely different places from if we're worried about extinction, which we also should be. Um, and to, just to mention, uh, the nasty ecological surprises, Kate mentioned COVID, and about two-thirds of diseases that have jumped into people over the last 70 years were driven into people because of land use change. So actually, it's, it's the degradation of the ecosystems that's driving the single biggest shock to the global socio-economic system that we've had in our lifetimes. So trying to stop extinctions leads to one kind of focus. Trying to maintain ecosystem integrity leads to another kind of focus. One of the concerns I have is that the Convention on Biological Diversity will try to come up with a headline target for the post-2020 framework. There is no number. There is no single target that conserves both these things because they are distributed so differently. If they come up with any single number, I would argue that's a disastrous outcome, whether or not we make the target. It's just guaranteed to fail. We need targets about species extinction, but we also need targets about ecosystem integrity. And I would agree, genetic diversity as well. Um, and nature's contributions to people. And they have to be joined together in the way that they're phrased and particularly the way that they're targeted. Because we kind of know what we need to do, actually. It's, it really isn't any kind of rocket science. We know that if we're going to have a chance of bending the curve, and it's an open question whether or not it'll be enough. We have to conserve and restore habitats, particularly, particularly species-rich, unique, carbon-rich habitats, given that we also need to get to net zero as quickly as possible and prevent runaway climate change. Our health and environmental health will improve if we farm in less damaging ways if we reduce pollution. And we also need to be consuming less. I was at COP26, and one of the things that was really terrifying was the extent to which it's a trade fair. The idea that reducing consumption is part of the solution was very low on the agenda behind the, you know, the, ma the major players. But actually, we need to consume less stuff. There are ways we can do it without decreasing our quality of life, with dietary shifts, for instance, and uh, improving the efficiencies of the food system, but we've got to do it. But it's going to cost money. So there's not really ever much enthusiasm among decision makers for spending money early. The temptation is to defer. Can we wait? Do we have to start now? I'm going to answer that question very quickly in two ways both of which are, yes, we have to start now. So here is how quickly it's getting worse. This is one of the most biodiverse islands in the world, Borneo. Biodiversity intactness index, the fraction of naturally present biodiversity that's left, two years, 11 years apart. And it's a tragedy. So it's getting worse really, really quickly. And then economically, we can ask the question, because we can model these indicators. We can model rates of species extinction. Biodiversity intactness index comes from a model. 
So we can ask by integrating biodiversity models and economic models of land use, what's the economic cost of delaying? And so we did two scenarios. This was work for the Das Gupta review on the economics of biodiversity. The premise is we, we have to act. So to get to a given outcome in 2050, should we start now? How much more, if any more, would it cost if we delayed by a decade? So we're going to choose scenarios that bend the curve. They improve BII. They improve the outlook for extinction. And it's focused on reforestation and conservation of forests because we get climate benefits too, obviously. So delay by a decade, double the cost. That works out as an 8% annual rate of return on investing in nature. That's almost as good as inflation. So you can, according to these models, bend the curve if you make an absolutely huge effort starting in 2030. Biodiversity benefit doesn't accrue straight away, which is why it continues to fall until 2040 before showing this really steep increase. <gasps> I touched the screen. But you're actually having to restore almost something the size of the Amazon rainforest in 20 years is not clear that we actually can do that. Whereas if we start now, the restoration that's required is, is biophysically possible. Ooh. Um, final point, yep. That's a model. That's using models. And models are crucial here. It's vital that we monitor. It's vital that we're tracking biodiversity in all these ways. But if we base our knowledge based on samples that we've taken through time, we're trying to land this, well, we're trying to navigate to the future by looking out of the rear window. And that's, frankly, silly. What we need is a sat-nav whereby we say where we want to go, and then we use our models to make our forecasts. Are we going in the right direction? If not, we need to adjust our policies. Iterate until we think we are on track, then take action, but monitor. Because Gideon mentioned climate's way ahead of us in terms of the conversation. It's also true with the modeling. Climate modeling's 20 years more mature. We have to get to the same level really, really quickly the only way we're going to do that is by starting to bet the farm on the models, but monitoring and learning and tightening this loop. Really important in the Convention on Biological Diversity post-2020 framework is that we close this loop. At the moment, the people who monitor are not the people who model. Most monitoring doesn't feed into models at all. So, we depend absolutely on nature, and that's particularly true of the poorest, most vulnerable people in the world. They can't afford for us to not do this. The longer we leave it, the more it will cost. We know that. And we have to get a sat-nav so that we can see what's coming and persuade people that we don't have to go for the car crash option. We can get to the future safely. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. That was so thought-provoking. I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience, although if we don't get any, I'm sure we can stimulate a lot of discussion just among the group. Yes. yes. Um, so thank you very much. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm very tricky. I'm, I'm first in now, so I'm in the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, so Gideon will be one of my bosses, in effect. Um, and we, our work involves a lot of different aspects of biodiversity. Uh, there's a lot of very thought-provoking stuff.
actually develop goals where we're going to look at something like net zero. And then I've got to say, I was extremely excited, Andy, to hear about the sat nav, because I've just mm. been, we've just had various debates on this. James Lucy is actually responsible for many of the indicators of nature. Um, and I thought maybe some kind of a dashboard that shows different types of things going on. Uh, so we can see, uh, you sa as you said, Gideon, you can't just have one indicator. You can't just have... I don't know if that's on. I don't think yeah. so. I'll try. Oh, oh yeah. there we are. Oh, yeah. Okay, yep. sorry. No, right, I'll stop chatting then. Um, so, um, yeah, you could have a dashboard uh, so that you can have an indicator of, say, uh, what is loosely called soil health, microbial biodiversity, or whatever. You could have other indicators um, showing mammalian diversity, blah de blah, uh, pollution. Perhaps you could show nitrates and so on. But does it become too complicated? Is it impossible to communicate uh, via? something like a dashboard or because we can't produce the single one metric we can't say net zero carbon because that is just not meaningful in the in in regard to biodiversity so can i'll ask you all could you imagine being able to communicate to the important people the government's policy makers using something like a dashboard Andy, since you talked about the set, now would like to start. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think it's a great question. JNCC, uh, you know, the, the UK leads the world in terms of rich, granular biodiversity data, and we have this fantastically mature set of indicators, but they are looking out of the rear window. Also, they are not... So one of the, the difficulties, biodiversity, great phrase, great word, Everyone was able to buy in in the research community because everyone studies biodiversity. No one measures biodiversity, though. They study the bird diversity or the butterfly diversity, and so we've got indicators for all these different things. I was focusing on a general biodiversity indicator, biodiversity and Tacnus index, and also extinction risk, which is a, a fairly you know, general thing as well. I would favour going for a small number of very broad but well-defined measures. I don't think it can be a single one for the reason I gave. Species extinction is really important, but for completely different reasons from biodiversity intactness. So I would argue that there's two or maybe three. Species extinction, bad thing. Ecosystem integrity, good thing, and maybe a species abundance measure as well. And Georgina published a paper, of course, proposing that in 2018, the original Bending the Curve. It's a small enough number to convey and explain. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly the right question for policymakers, and I'm sure Gideon will have a view as well, having, being a chief scientific advisor. I would say that it is perfectly possible um, for politicians at the highest level and for lawmakers at the highest level and certainly for the intelligent civil servants to be able to understand a system and to be able to understand a dashboard and I think sometimes we feel that we have to cons we have to convince every member of the public I don't think we do I think we have to have a framework which recognizes a model um, and measures the the um, the outputs from that from that model the other thing I would say is that um, you I think you said you're about sort of 10 or 20 years behind the, mm. the, 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 um, the um, acceptance of, um, of climate change and, uh, and those models, um, and, so in, and also in terms of modelling. Um, I would say that a good idea, just as a politician, a good idea now in terms of campaigning or in terms of raising awareness with lawmakers is to mm -hmm. um, start putting forward the concept of a model. And what will happen is there will be massive pushback because scientists from all different fields will begin to argue those are the wrong things to measure, your model's rubbish and ours mm -hmm. is better. But the thing is, climate change had to go through that same process. It had mm. to go through that process. And as a politician, I'm used to the rough and tumble of arguments and debates and agreeing and disagreeing and walking out of rooms and coming back. But actually, I think if you want to accelerate the process of acceptance, um, then I think you have to have that public debate. You have to really raise it up and accept that people are going to shoot it down, you're going to be furious. We, some politicians will say one thing, some will say another um, to suit their political agenda. And the final thing I would say is that um, 
is that measurement is important. Even in a system, if there's a system and a model, actually the measurement that we can demonstrate where in that cycle of the model, like the particular position of the model we're in, you do need to be able to measure. My personal concern at the moment, and even looking at the post notes we're producing now, is that somehow we've got to settle the model issue and what we're measuring and what we're trying to protect um, or what we're trying to repair um, so that we can have the measurements where we can then hold politicians to account. And hopefully in a few years' time, in the same way that the climate is top of the agenda and people have a good shout at me if something's going wrong, um, I would hope that people will be shouting at me if something's going wrong on biodiversity as well. So again, I'm optimistic, but I think there is a bit of work to be done to make sure that those models are being discussed in government and in world organisations so that at some point one of them is adopted even as a default initially so that then we accept the measurement systems. So my, my addition to the, the, what would be rich answers already is to say that I think uh, we, we do have to measure, and I hope I said that clearly in my talk, and it's really important to help understand the science. It's really important to help us set policies, and it's really important to help measure the success or otherwise of those policies as well. So those measurements are critical, and we need a diversity of those, those measurements because it's biodiversity we're trying to measure. But from a communication point of view, I actually don't think the measurements are the most fundamental thing. I think that from a communication point of view, it's connecting why biodiversity matters to people. Yeah. So why, why does anyone care that there's a million species um, threatened with extinction? I mean, at a sort of f fundamental ethical basis, people do care. But when it comes to you know, cost of living crisis or where's my next job coming from, why should they care about an individual species going extinct? So we need to tell the stories and communicate the science in a way that brings it home to people, why it matters to them and their communities. And that's the communication challenge that's most important. Uh, thanks for your question. Um, just reflecting on all of those comments and just thinking about, a, I think a dashboard is a good place to start. And I think that you know, even that is a, a, is a complex matter and a, a real time dashboard, can you imagine, for all mm. of the indicators would be incredible, an incredible start. But I think it's just a start. And I think people will want to know a more of a kind of, they want more local action. And so they want that kind of dashboard to be more applicable to them. So that kind of yeah. gets to your comment. They, they want to see that they said, can we save this park? And actually it's gone up. Or I didn't use pesticide in my garden. Now I've got a, a, a black cap. You know, that's the kind of thing that we need. And actually, we're talking about massive scaling up of monitoring, which we just are not capable of doing at the moment. And I think that we've got to think about how to do that, whether that's, you know, <laughs> thinking, of, thinking out of the box. So, you know, there, there are micro, micro telescopes that the astronomers use across Southern Africa. All of Southern Africa is covered by one of these in a grid. Why don't we have one for biodiversity, like acoustics, eDNA? We can, we can do that, you know, and have that kind of system so that people have local agency, they feel engaged to nature, they know what the success is. The final point is, uh, you know, I, I'm supportive of Andy about the model, um, but I do think we could do with some, uh, not just exact measures of abundance, but comparative measures of abundance. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to do absolute measures of abundance, why save the UK at all? Mm. Just <laughs> basically go to Brazil. You know, so why would you do that? So I think what we would really need is some kind of relative measure. Exactly, I'm just copying Andy, because that's probably what I've done my entire career. <laughs> um, what, I, what I'm kind of saying is that the His Predicts project is looking at um, an intact area and then more deg a, a degradation gradient. And probably what we need to do is develop some relative abundance measures if we're going to do this at all, so that we can see what an intact habitat in, say, in pasture woodland would look like. What were the species present? What does the, the microbe, the ribosomal networks look like? And then look at the transformation of that the more intensely you go. And so we have these local metrics so it's like it, it's an intactness index at a very local scale. So I would say I, I would, I, it's not just, you know, 
I don't think just us should do it. I've talked to a number of startups and entrepreneurs who need a biodiversity index that are, have got millions and millions of pounds to put in this because they see what the market is. And I think that could be something that we could, we could get behind. And mm. you know, you've got 100, of peop 100 people here and there'll be 100 different opinions, of, no, 110 <laughs> different <laughs> opinions about that. But you know, that's something, I, I want to capture that sense of place and that sense of ownership and that sense of the value of nature and the sense that you can do something and you can see it has an effect. And the only way I think we can do that is by massive scale up. I'm gonna jump, oh, there Ranting. is another question, sorry. Ranting. I was gonna come, I mean, it's quickly come out. I could not agree more about your comment about being able to measure locally as well. So uh, local action, but also they, they, we're poised for a real revolution. And things like you can you can almost get an app that will listen t to your garden and tell you what birds are there. Yeah. You, you yeah. Can yeah. Get an app. It's not it's I'll not very that. mature, <laughs> but it's getting there. No, no, no you can. But there is an app, and I've built a sensor in my garden which tells me in real time what birds are there. And these these things are cheap. Yeah, you, you can it you can build twenty quid. Them. Yep, that's that's <laughs> that will be transformational. Hi everyone. Um, firstly, thank you so much for all the wonderful presentations and lovely debate so far. Um, I have a question particularly for Adam, but also I'd like to hear all of your kind of thoughts about this. So a lot of us here are scientists. We like our statistics <laughs> and we like our statistics. Well, <laughs> actually I say that we kind of like our statistics, <laughs> but we do like them to be represented properly. So post notes are great. They, they are the good way to communicate actual science to politicians. But given that also we have repeated misrepresentation of statistics called out by the people who made it throughout politics, how can we as the public and as scientists hold politicians accountable or trust politicians like yourself mm. to hold people within and outside of your party accountable to truly honest representations of science and statistics? Um, my quick answer to that is you'll be lucky because at the end of the day, <laughs> because at the end of the day, um, we do have the uh, Office of National Statistics. We have a lot of bodies out there that hold the, the real numbers, particularly when it comes to economic economic figures. But you're not going to stop it. Um, my, the, the virtuous thing that I feel that I do within Westminster is to make sure that basically the science, peer-reviewed science, is um, is um, underpinning the, the foundations of debate. So if individual politicians or individual ministers or individual members of the opposition, I literally listen to any debate in the House of Commons, someone said, I mean, one of the key things I was really trying hard to introduce, but then we had coronavirus and all sorts of other things, was that as members of parliament become elected and they enter the House of Commons, as peers come into the House of Commons, I wanted an induction session for politicians on, stati on science, but on statistics in particular, and also the um, scientific um, way of thinking because a lot of politicians come from kind of classics background so that based what they're interested in is professor so-and-so said this this particular authority said that but they're not interested in what they actually they just want to pick the thing that's correct and helps them or pick the number that helps them so uh, you know uh, and these courses need to take very long they just be induction training when so that we so that when a politician or anyone hears it's gone up by 33 percent you know the top three questions to ask well what over what period and against what, 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 um, against what data set are you talking? Um, uh, um, and I think that that would help to resolve some of it. But ultimately, it's for the media uh, to hold politicians to account. It's for colleagues within Westminster to hold politicians to account. And it's for the public to hold politicians to account. Now, I'm not being um, pessimistic about it, but I think um, if you honestly, if you just do, maybe somebody can um, do a, a, a PhD on this <laughs> or a master's, but if you actually look at any polit politician from any political persuasion, including Greens, including Labour, including Lib Dems, every last one of, every last one of us at some point would have misrepresented data. So it's really, it's, we've got to be held to account, um, um, but don't think that there's, there's one person doing it particularly much more than another. And when you're in Westminster, you, 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 you see that all the time, yeah. So can I come in on the, uh, so Adam's given the politician's answer. Perhaps <laughs> I'll give the civil servant's answer and put some of the, and uh, Adam's yeah, put, put some of the blame on politicians. So I'll do the same and put some of the blame on the civil service. I think there is, um, there, there is a challenge in the fact that the civil service is not sufficiently scientific and doesn't typically feed the politicians um, scientific information, often wordy textual information 
and changing the civil service so it more instinctively uses data, is willing to present statistics and uncertainties and graphs to ministers and help them through them if they don't immediately understand them. That's a way of transforming and helping to answer the, the problem that you're pointing to. Emma. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks for a great discussion. My name's Emma Cavan, I'm a research fellow here. Um, I have a question which is more towards government and thinking, is it government's responsibility or should it be government's responsibility to hold companies and businesses to account for their kind of biodiversity and climate schemes that they're doing? Because a lot of companies, you know, we talked a lot about the individual person in their home connected with nature, but really kind of global change is going to come from businesses and companies changing and then we're forced to change as the consumer. Um, and with climate, this is already starting to happen and it's very much from a PR point of view um, often or to make money from offsetting schemes. And do you think it's the government's responsibility to try and hold these big uh, companies to account and to make sure that they're actually doing what they say they're doing to protect the environment? Is it something that's already happening? Because this stuff is really quite new policy, I guess. It's also very new science to a lot of civil servants. So I was just wondering what the landscape was on that in government at the moment. Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, absolutely the right question. Um, and I think that absolutely, the, the government's um, primary function is to keep its citizens safe and healthy. That is it. That's the primary duty of any government, to protect them, give them security, make them safe and healthy. So if biodiversity is going to kill them, then it's their primary, primary responsibility to make sure they deal with it in some way. The mechanism that the, go the government uses is obviously, or not government, but that Parliament uses is legislation. And now I'm a Conservative with a small C and a big C, and um, I have a business background before politics. And my observation is this, is if you produce the correct um, incentives in the tax system and the correct penalties in the tax system and, for, um, uh, and for, for operations for businesses, they will do the right thing. Why? Because they can't make any money if they don't do the right thing. So I don't believe in necessarily the virtue of businesses. I don't actually, I'm not even sure that I want businesses to be virtuous. What I want them to do is to make as much money as is humanly possible for their shareholders because that is their function in our society. Providing employment, making money for their shareholders that goes into our pension funds, that funds all your science and research. So I think the key thing is what the government's responsibility is, is to make sure that both the regulations and the tax system, um, tax and, uh, incentive system, penalty system is correct so that businesses operating with that environment are delivering the social good, the economic good and the environmental goods that we're looking for. So can I, oh, do, so can I come in just quickly, um, uh, again just to build on what Adam has said, I think there, there, is, there is a role for government not to tell um, industry what to do but to police the way that they report it and, yeah. um, and it was one example of, of that would be on food labelling where there's an increasing push of individual companies to move towards putting on their labels, this is low carbon or good for biodiversity. Um, there's a role for government to make sure those labels are honest and that the consumer is not being fooled. And more broadly in biodiversity, I think there is, uh, this, we're quite early into this in carbon offsetting. The market is already quite mature and you might say quite um, broken. But um, in biodiversity, we're early into this process. And there is an opportunity through processes like net gain and, and a broader definition of green finance to try and do a better job of biodiversity. So we value it and make sure everyone uses the same set of values in, in their processes. Um, yeah, I, I'd just like to come in too on this uh, and also relates a little bit to the, to the, the previous question as well. I completely agree with, with uh, Adam that we need to have uh, our legislative systems set up in such a way that businesses that are acting sustainably are not having to be altruistic in order to do it. If self-interest and sustainability are aligned, then we should be on a good track. A difficulty though at the moment is that that is not sufficiently the case, which means that yes, <laughs> Money's going into pensions to provide for security in the long-term future, but at the cost of security in the long-term future. That feels kind of not joined up fully at the moment. And one thing that, that does concern me, so I think Post is fantastic. I think the work they do is brilliant in terms of giving a very up-to-date, current, expert, dispassionate, even-handed treatment 
of complex issues in a way that is, you know, faultless and admirable. Unfortunately, that's not the only sort of voice that parliamentari parliamentarians hear. What I would love is for lobbyists who lobby in bad faith to be barred. Something like three strikes and you're out. I think then there would be a lot less disinformation on the tips of quite so many parliamentarians' tongues so that the information that's provided through post would have a better chance of emerging from, well, I was going to say the noise, but it isn't noise, it's signal. It's signal of vested interests who are benefiting to the public detriment. Um, I just wanted to come in uh, maybe to... <laughs> Sorry, I don't. Okay. Um, I I've been very concerned about the kind of noises that we were hearing from the Conservative government about net zero over the last couple of weeks, mm. and it kind of I, I I knew of that politician who was against net zero, and one of my colleagues had lunch with him to understand what the problem was, but I, I fundamentally maybe I'm just naive about. Why, why they would be against net zero? I, just fundamentally, I don't, I don't understand that process where a group of right-wing politicians can derail or start to derail an act in Parliament which we've agreed on. You know, I, I don't understand that, and, and I, 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 it kind of rips the rug under mm. us because mm. we thought that you'd agreed on an act. <laughs> And we were working towards that. Yeah. And that gives you hope. And then you've got, I can't remember, it was Steve Baker, mm. who wants to get rid of net zero and won't listen to any evidence. OK. Um, so, so to <laughs> <laughs> but the, the broader yeah. point is that, that how does that, it's the kind of information yeah. disinformation. Yeah. Mm. Well, look, at the end of the day, um, um, the target for 2050 is government policy. Okay, it's Conservative Party policy. It hasn't changed. Okay, I'll make a prediction. It won't change. What we'll be quibbling about, I mean, it really won't change. I and mean, it's, it's so locked in, it's just not going to change. What, we're, what we're, we, we will quibble about, and you even saw it during the leadership contest, people giving slightly, if you look at them closely, <laughs> slightly, <laughs> really just slightly different nuances. Well, you know, we, we do want to commit to 2050, but we need to do something different in the very short term. But they weren't, nobody was really resiling from it. So those are the people who want to lead the party, the last two are equally committed to net zero. So I don't think that's going to change. I think what you're hearing there, there and you, you know, it's, it's right to be alarmed and good right if he's, if he's your local MP write a letter saying what's wrong with you <laughs> okay um, because at the end of the day these this is what politics is about it's about different voices and about different coalitions of people and ultimately it's about who you guys elect if you elect people who don't agree with net zero then then the, maybe that target will go away I don't think it's going to happen but um, equally, that, this is why it's really important, and this is why I'm pleased that the environment is right up the agenda, because these are the long-term concerns we have as a nation. It's really important that when you vote, you're thinking about these things. But I'll be honest with you, if democracy suddenly delivers a different government, they will be perfectly at liberty to change, you know, get rid of net zero. Yeah. And that's why what you're doing here in research, in science, in campaigning, is absolutely vital. But please, I just, I just reassure you, just because two or three MPs say something, it doesn't mean that the world's going to change. It really doesn't. They'll, they'll work hard. They'll I've work hard. about though. Brexit, to be honest. So I don't oh, <laughs> oh, I've got the scars. <laughs> Let's not go there. I think this raises an interesting overarching point, though. So all of the speakers pointed out that our evidence base about biodiversity loss has accumulated mm. over the same time period that biodiversity loss has accelerated. So I'm interested in hearing your different perspective on what is the most important lever to push to reconcile that and get us on the right path. Is it government? Is it the way that business operates? Is it the onus on the individual voter or consumer? Hmm. Sh shall I go first? I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief this time. So, so basically, I, uh, sorry to be a bit, um, a bit tedious, but I think it's just a combination of, the, I think it's a combination of all three things. It's a combination of um, research taking place, um, models being debated and argued through. It's a case of the public being aware 
And I think that's, there is beginning to be some cut through on biodiversity, sometimes not on all the measures that we want to look yeah. at. Sometimes it's just on extinction, um, sometimes it's on just the butterflies in your garden. But at the end of the day, I think it is beginning to get cut through. Um, and um, third, it is about, I'll use the word lobbying in, in a different sense. Than your, it, it is about um, people um, and groups who care about the environment, who care about biodiversity, scientists with them all lobbying government, lobby government. Um, to make sure now why are we trailing behind I think that Parliament um, always and I think it's right actually Parliament always um, is a late adopter and in some ways it's the nature of a democracy that you have to be certain um, in Westminster in a democracy that the social mores or the the opinions or the zeitgeist of the day has actually changed um, and this is why on all sorts of issues, whether they're social issues about homosexuality, whether they're issues about, and we've got this whole trans de debate going on at the moment, we should wait, we shouldn't rush. If Parliament starts to lead the way on these things, believe me, it will be a disaster because as you observe, some politicians have very odd views and sometimes with a bit of working together, they can develop a, a, an impetus that the public don't want. So sometimes it's quite good that we're trailing. And I would say that on biodiversity right now, I'll be frank, knowing a lot of the science around it, I'm actually pleased that we're trailing, but I'm pleased that it's coming up the agenda that it is now acknowledged. And I think it's right that we trail until, until we put the framework in place, but until we're quite sure that that is the direction, the measurement system we're using, we've, we've formed that consensus as a society. Now, I'm not saying trailing for another 20 years on it. I think in this one, we can move quite quickly. I think in, in probably in two or three years time, with the right type of work going on, we should be in a place to actually have a framework and to have a kind of tentative measure sy measurement system that we can use. Could I, I'd, li I'd answer it by, by combining it with the last question, the, the Kate's controversial question perhaps. <laughs> And I think that uh, my, my perception about the net zero debate in government is that it's unlikely to change, the government's position is unlikely to change because most politicians um, in government have recognised the economic sense of tackling net zero. And it might be that you do have to spend a bit of money now, but if you don't spend it, you spend much more later in order to adapt to the change and, 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 and protect your society into the future. And I think that is the same basic narrative that we have to use uh, on in the biodiversity area and we saw some I some statistics on that earlier in the, in the talks how the longer we leave it to act on biodiversity the more costly it becomes so although it may be painful for a farmer to need to change the amount of fertilizer and change how much runs off into the streams around their field right now if they don't do it right now it, the long-term consequences and the long-term damage will be more costly that's the way we get, we get politicians and ultimately sec the industrial sectors to come with us I'd just like to raise just a warning that if the responses were always smooth so that things got incrementally worse, slowly, mm -hmm. and the levers could affect change relatively quickly, I wouldn't be worried. But I am worried that when we get the sort of trigger that shows that we haven't been acting quickly enough, the global recession <laughs> and insecurity that that uh, tipping point will cause will mean that we don't have the money. We, we need to fix the roof while the sun is relatively shining and I know it's only relatively but if we wait we'll never do it. Sorry, can I make one more point? No, okay, to the young. So in the, the work, uh, I've been doing some work on the social economic pathways of change and humans respond to shocks. So mm. how do we, I think that's very aspirational, mm. what you just said. And I think we need to be more realistic about how we do that. So I, I think we can work with human nature, but we, we need to think about how people respond and people respond to shocks. So how do we make them shocked? I think the planet's been trying to help over the last <laughs> few days. <laughs> But, but it hasn't led, you were mentioning the, the leadership contest at the moment, it hasn't led to the two front runners or any of them wanting to move faster, has it? I can't imagine a much bigger shock than we've had. They did stop going on about net zero though. <laughs> okay. I think we're reaching the yeah. point where we have to transition <laughs> yeah. this discussion to over drinks, which might be a good thing. Help us move through these arguments and uh, follow up on some of the points raised. 
So thank you guys so much. Thank you all so much. It was really fascinating. Yeah, and uh, we'll continue the conversation. So it was right. Um, yeah, it, um, if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll drop Thank you, you an email. Thank you, yeah, everyone, uh, for a fantastic debate. Um, there, there are one or two people who had some burning questions that they didn't manage to uh, get answered, so I would suggest that uh, over a few civilised drinks, uh, come and speak to the panel members, and hopefully you'll get, you'll get the answers you're seeking. Uh, but I'd love to thank everyone, the audience, everyone who's helped organise this in particular, um, the Georgina Mace Centre, and particularly our guests today for a fantastic and really thought-provoking uh, debate. Thank you very much.